particles like these so fast and cool. Bombs out of mechanics and pipe up some cold words. But no one can deny the fact that on the theory works. I'll start this video with talking about three scientists who won the Nobel Prize in 1971 for a really important theory that explained superconductivity. So we have John Bardeen, which is this fella here. We've got Leon Cooper, this fella here, and Robert Schrieffer. And they won the Nobel Prize in 1972 for the BCS theory, which was meant to explain why exactly there are some elements that lose their resistance when they go past their critical temperature. Right? So obviously you can see the BCS theory and their last names, Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer. Well, the BSC theory is just named after them, after their three last names, the scientists that came up with that theory. And the idea behind that theory was that we observed, not we, but some scientists first observed uh, the idea of superconductivity in 1912. Right? So 1912 was when we found this found out that the superconductivity actually exists. Superconductivity. And what was superconductivity again? That was when we have a critical temperature, which we call Tc, same thing as critical temperature. And this would be a Tc right here. And what this means is that as soon as we get to this temperature, which let's say is 1.2 Kelvin, for example, 1.2 Kelvin, which will be the critical temperature for aluminium, as soon as we get below this temperature for aluminium, what happens is there's virtually no resistance. So anything below it is there's no resistance, which means the electrons can flow unimpeded and we have perfect conduction. Right? And this was not what we expected. We expected it to behave like this, where we have resistance, temperature being high, meaning resistance being high, and then moving to a point where we have no more temperature, zero Kelvin. We still have a slight bit of resistance because we always expect there to be some possible collisions. But we found that some elements and some alloys and some compounds actually acted like superconductors, which meant they had this critical temperature, after which, so below which, there are no more, there's no more resistance. And Albert Einstein and some of the other famous Planck, um, they all lived at the time. So when this superconductivity Superconductivity was actually kind of found out that it exists. Albert Einstein actually lived. And he was obviously really important when it comes to quantum theory. And how it actually all works has to do with quantum theory. But he didn't he didn't know the explanation. So he didn't know why superconductivity exists or how that works. But in 1972, these three gentlemen came up with one theory that is there to help explain how this is possible. Right? So he, Albert Einstein hadn't figured it out. But these three gentlemen gave a theory which tried to explain the observed phenomenon here, which we call the critical temperature of certain elements, making them superconductors, below this temperature. Uh, so we have to actually discuss. The dot point itself says discuss. And this verb, in this case, discuss is really important because that means not just describe, but give the positive and negative parts of this theory. Discuss the BCS theory of superconductivity. So what I'll do first is I'll just quickly outline of how it actually works. I'll give the steps of how this actually works. And remember, this is a quantum, um, this is a theory that uses quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics are really complicated. So this actual, what I'd go over now, these couple of steps is very simplified. Right? It's not actually exactly how it is, but it's just simplified to allow you to be able to understand it and appreciate it. But if you know this, these five steps, you're not expected to know the exact details of the mechanics, but if you know these five steps and you know how it roughly works, that's good enough. Right? You don't need to understand the whole theory. It's too complicated. It will take up too much time to be able to, and I don't even understand it myself, so I couldn't even explain it if I wanted to. But the idea is just you have a simplified version, which will be good enough to get you to the point where you're actually going to be able to answer your questions in UHC. Now we've got the five steps. So first step is we want to be below the critical temperature, right? So below the critical temperature, there will still be some vibrations. So the, below the critical temperature, the vibrations are minimal. Now we call the normal vibrations, we call them phonons, but below the critical temperature, we call them the virtual phonons because they're so small that they're almost not there. They're so small, they're almost not there. And that's going to be important in a second. I'll just talk about that in a second. That's the first step. We want to be below this temperature. 
but you all should know that below this temperature, there's still some vibrations that actually do happen. They're not called phonons anymore, they're called virtual phonons. The second step, or second part, what you should notice in this theory, is that the electrons traveling in front disturb the lattice. So what I mean by this is these electrons, right, they travel in a straight path here. And as they move past, we have the positive nuclei. Uh, this is a negative electron being shown by the negative dash. These will be attracted to the negative, so the positive will come a bit closer to the negative because they're attracted. And that's what I mean by disturbed. And there's two in the third, second and third dot, they come they come together. So the electron traveling in front disturbs the lattice, but the lattice movement is delayed. So it means that it's now here, it's right here, it's gonna pass through these two. And it's not gonna they, those two won't come down instantly. They'll actually come down a bit delayed. So once they're pass, that's when these guys will come down. And they'll come down now. Because it's delayed. That's what I mean by delayed. It's gonna take them a bit of time. So enough time for the electron to pass through it, which is good because if it happened at the same time, that would mean that this electron would be going into the actual positive nuclei, which means it would lose energy. But because it happened because it's delayed, it basically doesn't happen. It doesn't they don't collide. But what does happen is in this area we're gonna have a very positively charged area between these two. Right, so this area is super positively charged. Right, so I'll go through step one, two, three. We, we at three at the moment. We have this delayed lattice, which I've drawn again here. So we have these. This electron had has already passed. Right, so it used to be here, then it passed through, and when it passed through, we have this these phonons. Right, this is what we call the, the virtual phonon. It's like a tiny vibration, virtual phonon, and it moved closer because of the attraction to negative. And now it's left a really positive area here. And that's what meant, is meant by step four. Positive region created behind the first electron. Right? So as the first electron moves past, we have this positive region being created. Now what happens is what is in the negative electron behind it, the second electron, what is it attract what is it what will it be attracted to? Well it will be attracted to the positive region here. Right? It's going to be attracted to positive, and this is really positive right there. So it's going to be attracted to it, it's going to move towards it. And a good thing is, if it were to, if these guys were to stay there, if these two nuclei were to just remain there, what would happen would, this negative electron would bash into it, would, would collide with it, would lose energy. But because these are virtual phonons, that means they have a high recoil, so they recoil easily. And what I mean by recoil easily is they bounce back into their original shape quite easily. They recoil quite quickly. So what will happen is, once they have created this positive field, they're going to bounce back into their original shape, leaving that that positive field there for a very short period of time. It's not going to be there for long, but it's going to be there for long enough for this electron to move into it. And then that electron will have moved as well, and will move in and then move past. And I'm not meant to grab that blue stuff. So the idea is that there's no collision here at all, right? These virtual phonons make sure that it's going to be going there and then going back fast enough to make sure there's absolutely no collision with the actual electrons, but it will actually propel the electrons. These positive holes make these electrons move really fast, but they make it move straight, right? They're always going to make it move in a straight line. And these two electrons that do this, we call a electron pair, or in this case, a Cooper pair. So a Cooper pair, again, named after a scientist, Cooper. But there's not just going to be these two. There's going to be more. It's going to be more here as well. And now these two will act also like a Cooper pair. And then these two will eventually act like a Cooper pair. So you can imagine it'll be like a chain reaction. It's one after the other. And this is how we can make sure that there's absolutely no resistance. So with these Cooper pairs, they have no resistance. Which means there's no collisions at all with the actual lattice. Which means we have a perfect conductor or in other words, a super conductor because there's no resistance and these guys can just move unimpeded. Now I'll quickly cut, recap again. All right, so first we need to be below the critical temperature and below this critical temperature, there's still some vibrations. We call them the virtual phonons. These vibrations are tiny and they recall quite easily. So we have the electron, the first electron, the front electron moving past your actual positive nuclei. And the last movement is delayed, so that means these guys 
will take some time. They won't be colliding with the negative electron. They'll be delayed, which means they'll move past in this area once the electron has already passed. But when they do move here, that means they, they create a positive region or positive, not a whole, but a region, which means that the next electron will be quite attracted to that positive region, which means it will move straight towards it. And because it has such a high co recoil, so step four was positive region created behind first electron, step two was second electron attracted to positive region, and lattice rebounds back into original shape. So it's attracted to it, but at the same time, these, elect these positive nuclei will bounce back before the electron gets there, which means no collisions. Remember, that's important, no collisions. And that means the electron has not moved there, it's in a straight line, has not collided with any of the actual um, phonons, and these two, this combination of how this worked is what we call the Cooper pair. And it's going to be lots of Cooper pairs. They're going to form and reform constantly to make sure we have a constant stream of electrons going straight without any resistance, and that's what we call the superconductor. And that was their theory, the BCS theory, and that holds true for all the metals. So, for example, um, the aluminium, which has a critical temperature of 1.2 Kelvin, or mercury, which has a critical temperature of 3.4 Kelvin. Uh, my battery's running out, that's good to know. Um, those two, it will work for, right? So it says, discuss the BCS theory of superconductivity. This is the theory, and it works perfectly fine for aluminium and mercury. But for your cuprates, which are the ones which have both copper and oxygen in its actual its actual copper <laughs> spelled with copper 2p copper and oxygen in its actual formula so this would be one example the one we mentioned earlier we've got copper here and we've got oxygen here for these guys this doesn't apply this theory doesn't work for these guys because they don't actually have um, this kind of structure they don't have this kind of metal structure they have a structure where you can see we've got these sheets of copper oxides and they are really good superconductors, but it doesn't work for these Cooper pairs. Right? Cooper pairs was for your metals, but for your actual cuprates, we are guessing, we don't actually know exactly how it works, but we're guessing the actual way that they become superconductors is for these antiferromagnetism properties that these Cooper oxides produce. Don't need to know details of it, but what you should know for this part of the dot point is you, when you discuss it, you say, okay, this is a theory, it works perfectly fine for your aluminium and your mercury, for example, but it doesn't work for your cuprates, which are the ones which have a higher TC, critical temperature. And you'd say, okay, they don't work for it. And we believe there's other mechanisms, such as the antiferromagnetism, that makes these superconductors not your Cooper pairs. But yeah, that's a research, a area of research that we're trying to figure out more about. But at the moment, we are knowing that this theory, the BCS theory, doesn't apply to your actual cuprates. Right, that was that part of that dot point. So discuss means give the pros and the cons, or the good and the bad sides of the actual theory. The good part would be that it explains why your aluminium and mercury are superconductors. But the sort of negative aspect is it doesn't explain why cuprates are superconductors because they don't work with these cooper pairs. They have a different kind of, kind of structure. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.